Welcome back. From a cell phone data trail to the multiple sightings of a white Hyundai Elantra to the sheath of a still missing knife that's believed to be the murder weapon. If Brian Koberger is in fact the killer, he seems to have given police pretty much a roadmap right to his front door. And this, this is a man who was working towards a PhD in criminology. Again, if he's guilty, what happened? Was he blinded by passion or frightened out of his wits or did he want to get caught? I'm joined now by someone who has tackled these questions before in actually thousands of other cases, from Lacey Peterson to J.C. Dugard, but Paul Holes is most famous as the former cold case investigator who helped take down the Golden State Killer after decades on the loose. He is the author of the memoir, Unmasked. Paul, I thought of you right away. We expected so little evidence in this affidavit, and it was a cascade of, frankly, mystery upon mystery, and yet we do have what we have. And what we have is that there was a bolo, a be on the lookout for white Elantra on November 25th. And I think it was the 29th that they, ha they knew that he had one and they had his license with a description of him. They had so much so early. They had DNA on the, you know, the snap of the knife sheath um, that day. I, I don't understand how it takes so long. I don't know your business investigators, but help me. Well, you have to understand that the affidavit is, is really a retrospective. And so the detective who's writing it is writing chronological order on when information came in. But when you start talking about this bolo for the white Hyundai Elantra, you have to understand that when they are initially investigated, they don't even have a license plate for this Elantra. So when they are now gathering data going to the state's DMV and, and, and reaching out to other law enforcement agencies and, and their databases, they're getting thousands of bits of information of different registered owners of white Hyundai Elantras. Now, maybe Brian Kohlberger's name was in that list, but they didn't know that he was the, the killer at that point in time. At the same time, you have this parallel process going on with the lab, processing evidence and it takes time now they shockingly had this knife sheath that was left behind that ultimately had Kohlberger's DNA on it which is just for me it's just crazy that they had such great evidence but it takes time to go through to process not only the DNA from this sheath but they have mountains of other evidence in the case that the lab is probably working in batches. So it probably took some time, seven days, 10 days before they get their initial DNA results back. So they are juggling multiple things that take time and ultimately the stars aligned. The DNA added up, they had a, a, a suspect who had a white Hyundai Elantra and then as they dug further, circumstantial evidence really cemented the case. So that it's fascinating. I'm looking at this timeline and I've picked it all apart and made crazy notes looking through the, the affidavit. But November 29th, uh, a, a Washington State University police officer gets an Elantra and takes it right to Kohlberger's apartment. He, he sees that there's this Elantra, the, the Bolo's been out for five days and he, or four days, and he sees it at, he sees this one at, at Kohlberger's apartment. So he, he can read the plate and he says it's a, it's a uh, Pennsylvania plate. If you were to look at that plate, you got a, a stop on August 21st where there is body cam video with a guy with bushy eyebrows. And we know from day one that Dylan Mortensen said the guy in my house that night had bushy eyebrows. Then you get a second body cam, and that's on October 14th. And that one was also, um, this one was also Washington State University officers. And there is body cam, presumably to show bushy eyebrows. So you have two videos there, plus a license, a driver's license that gives a description exactly, exactly of the person that Dylan Mortensen described to the police. But then it looks like they didn't ask for the phone records, the historical phone records of this suspect because they, he'd given his phone number during one of those traffic stops, right? He gave them his phone number during the October, oh, the August 21st. They didn't start looking for historics on that until December 23rd. That, that to me is a bit of a surprise. 
Well, you know, and again, I think this is where, you know, the confusion comes in as you, know, you have this Washington State University cop who, who sees this white Hyundai Elantra. But this is one of many tips that law enforcement is fielding at the time. So until they have something that causes them to focus on Kohlberger, they're having to try to sort through all of these tips, you know, just because you have footage showing that you have a, a male that has bushy eyebrows, that isn't going to be sufficient to cause law enforcement to disregard all the other tips. This is where I believe that there's a likelihood that they had other more advanced DNA technology that was utilized that helped them focus in on Kohlberger. And then once they focused in based on that kind of technology, now they started adding things up. Oh, he drives a white uh, Elantra. You know, now you get the body cam footage. Now you get the cell phone records and the circumstantial case starts to cement itself. Did you have a, a bit of a flashback to the Golden State Killer? Because I got to say, I heard in this affidavit that Brian Kohlberger applied for an internship at the Pullman, Washington Police Department just in the fall, just a couple months ago. So presumably, it is sometime around the murder, right? The murder's on November 13th, and sometime in the fall, he's applying to be an intern with the cops, and the Golden State Killer is, of course, a cop, and, of course, the familial DNA that you worked to find him. Did you have that flashback? No, no, absolutely. There, there are parallels here with Kohlberger and D'Angelo. You know, D'Angelo went to school and got his degree in criminal justice. He became an, inter, an intern at Roseville PD and then ultimately was a cop while he's committing fetish burgs and numerous sexual assaults in, in Northern California. Here, Kohlberger's doing the same thing. In addition, Look at the crime that Kohlberger has been accused of. It's going into a residence at a time when the occupants are likely going to be asleep or falling asleep and then killing them. That's exactly what the Golden State Killer was doing. I would not be surprised if Kohlberger actually studied D'Angelo and the Golden State Killer case. That is so creepy. Um, so I got to ask you something because you told me something off air that just shocked me. I only have a minute left. But when murder detectives, when homicide detectives process the body, you said that they sometimes do not look for places where a, 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 a sex fetish killer will mouth and they won't think it's a sex crime. What did you mean by that? Well, what I've seen across the nation and even in California and jurisdictions next to mine is when crime scenes are processed and, and the victim's bodies are processed, they often limit themselves from a sexual assault evidence standpoint to just collecting the three orifice swabs, oral, vaginal, rectal. And then if those are negative for just semen and a pathologist says, I see no injuries to these orifices, they say, well, there's no evidence of sexual assault, but they often don't swab types of evidence that you can't see, such as saliva around the victim's mouth, in their hair, on their neck, on the intimate areas of their body, even down onto their toes or feet where we sometimes get offender DNA and saliva. So this evidence is often overlooked. I don't know what they did in this case. Maybe they did a great job processing these victims' bodies. However, it wouldn't surprise me that due to the nature of Kohlberger's background and the types of victims he's going after, that there's a possibility that there's a sexual component to this crime that was missed. It is so fascinating. You have got to come back. We have, we have a much longer conversation uh, to have about this because they said originally no evidence of a sex crime, but I promise you'll come back. I will be back. Paul Holes, always good to see you, author of Unmasked and uh, just one of the best detectives out there. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.